on your seminar series. So um, symbolic artificial intelligence, and I've heard it also referred to as good old fashioned artificial intelligence, is something that's not talked about much these days um, in sort of the press and things like that. And in fact, you see quite a lot of definitions of artificial intelligence that don't really include the kinds of techniques and technologies that I would say make up symbolic artificial intelligence. And what I'm aiming to do in this talk is not really a sort of deep technical dive into all the various different aspects of symbolic artificial intelligence, but to try and give an overview of the roots of this bit of the field, um, the kind of specific sub areas you get within symbolic AI, and maybe some thoughts about how it can combine with sort of the machine learning um, neural network type systems that currently um, sort of make up the bulk of the public consciousness about what AI involves. Ooh. So you can trace the roots of artificial intelligence back many centuries, in fact. So people have been fascinated, I think, always with the concept of machines and whether machines could think. But generally, artificial intelligence as a field um, is credited with starting um, in 1956 and the Dartmouth Summer Research Project. And I've heard this also referred to as the Dartmouth Conference or the Dartmouth Workshop, but it was a sort of eight week summer retreat. Um, and during that summer retreat, the term artificial intelligence was coined. So I think that's one of the reasons why people are particularly inclined to say that's where artificial intelligence began. And a number of the early, very influential people in the field um, attended the Dartmouth Summer Research Project. So I found this photo online, which shows some of them. It, we couldn't actually identify all of them, but you have people like John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, who you know, are absolutely foundational to the field. Now, if you look at the, the kind of report of the proposal and the, the, what happened at the, the project, you see aspects of what currently makes up the bulk of AI um, mentioned. So, I mean, they're calling them neural nets, but they're obviously thinking in the same terms as the sort of neural networks we look at today. Self-improvement was the term they were using for what we would now think of as machine learning. But actually, the kind of major outputs of that research project were much more in the field of symbolic AI. And one of the early outputs um, was a program called the logic theorist. And the logic theorist um, did mathematical proofs. Um, and so that was kind of what was driving um, advancements in artificial intelligence at that early stage. So although logic theorist was quite ad hoc, quite rapidly, um, the idea of doing mathematical proofs using computers began to cohere around a sort of specific set of ideas. Um, and for that, I'm going to go all the way back to the ancient Greeks. So I'm expecting at some point or other, you may have heard this term syllogism. Um, and the Greeks were quite interested in these. They didn't have a particularly formalized way of doing them, but they were trying to capture the idea of how people reason. Um, and they, at the time, believed reasoning was completely rational. I think we now believe that the way people realize, reason has a lot of other factors involved, including a lot of probabilistic processes. But at the time, they thought it was kind of fully rational and sort of determined. So they wrote things like this, this, um, this kind of famous syllogism, which I've got up here, so the syllogism is that if Socrates is a man, and we know that all men are mortal, then we can infer that Socrates is mortal. And they've written it in this sort of specific format where you have the two, the things you are assuming above the line, and then your conclusion appears below the line. And they had a kind of set of patterns of things that tried to capture their sense of patterns of reasoning. So you can see there's a sort of pattern here. You've got all X's are Y, if you like, and Socrates is an X, and therefore if he's, he's a man and all men are mortal, then you can conclude that Socrates is mortal. 
At this point, I'm going to do something a bit scary, which is I'm going to put up a whole load of logical notation. And I'd sort of hoped in this talk to get away without doing lots of logical notation. But actually, logical notation is quite compact. So I've written out what some of it means here. Where I use it on slides, I will repeat this information. So you don't need to feel like you need to memorize all these symbols here and now. But I just wanted to go through them. So we've got this V shape, and that means or when we're writing logical formulas. We have the kind of, I don't know, mountain shape, and that means and. We have an arrow that means implies, though something that um, often catches people out is when log logicians use the word implies, they're often not thinking of causation or not necessarily of causation, and that can trip people up. Um, so implies has a slightly different meaning in the way it's used. This kind of step shape is used to mean not. This upside down T means false. The upside down A means for all, and the backwards E means there exists. Um, over this side, because it'll turn out to be um, a kind of useful thing to know when I get to um, some of the technical stuff later, is that it's kind of a well-known um, theorem in, in logic and mathematics, that if you have a, uh, a kind of set of ands on one side, so if A is true and B is true and C is true, if all those three, three things are true, if that implies D, then in logic, that is actually the same as saying either D is true or A is not true. So that's that kind of funny step sign, A is not true, or B is not true, or C is not true. And some of this is because, as I say, that implies has a slightly different meaning in logic than is common. Um, so I just, I don't want to get into exactly why this is the case, but just remember that in logic, you can write A and B and C implies D, and that is actually, can be transformed into D or not A or not B or not C. So moving on, at the turn of the last century, um, what people started trying to do was take these ideas of patterns, these syllogisms that the, the Greeks were very interested in, and try and make them a bit more formal, a bit more procedural, so that you could actually, rather than someone just saying, oh, here is one and I know how to apply it, you could start having sort of, you know, ways of doing this. I guess what we would call maybe algorithms now. So Frege did a lot of work um, in formalizing how you can reason in logic. Um, and so when he talks about um, a logical calculus, the calculus consists of axioms. So these are things that are assumed to be always true. And I've given an axiom here. So this axiom says if A, so if A is true, and if A is true, that implies that B implies A. I mean, lots of axioms seem a bit trivial and strange. So if A is true, then any B implies that A is true. It doesn't sort of really matter what B is. But this is a statement that's true, and it turns out to be once quite useful for deriving theorems. So you have a set of axioms, things that you just assume are true, you don't try and justify those the case. Then you have things called inference rules. This is probably the most famous inference rule, it's called modus ponens. And you see we've got a similar format here to the one we had for the syllogisms. So above the line we have two things that either we are assuming or we've already proved are had true previously somehow and then we have a conclusion below the line. So if we know somehow that A is true, and we know that A implies B, then that means we are allowed to conclude that B is true. He also introduced this notation. So I had this thing earlier, the upside down A means for all. So this says for all X, P of X. So P is some statement about X's, like X is a man. So this would be for all x, um, x is a man, if that's what p means. And that allows him to kind of substitute individual things into these sorts of statements. Um, and here is a, an inference rule. Sorry, there shouldn't be an underline under that, that p of c. So if you have for all x, p of x, and c is any object you have in the world, so I don't know, umbrellas or shoes 
or Socrates, then if this statement is true, you can substitute this C, which is something you actually have, for the X, and you can drop this for all Xs. There's obviously a whole load of axioms and inference rules and a whole load of stuff you can do to derive things. But you end up with um, proofs. So this is um, some kind of proof. So we start at the top. We know that Socrates is Greek. And we know that for all X, if X is Greek, then that implies X is a man. This was many, many, many centuries ago. So yeah, women, not quite certain that they are conscious or sentient. So let's just go with men. Um, so that means, do you remember, we can drop the X and substitute anything we know we have in the world for the X. So we know Socrates exists in the world. So this means that we know if Socrates is Greek, then that implies Socrates is a man. Well, okay, so we know Socrates is Greek. And we know if Socrates is Greek, then that implies that he is a man. So then we can use the modus ponens rule and we can deduce that Socrates is a man. If we also have some information here that, so for all X, if X is a man, then X is mortal. We can do the same thing again. We can replace the X with Socrates. So now we know if Socrates is a man. That implies that Socrates is mortal. And since we've got the Socrates and man, and we have this implication, we can use modus ponens, and that allows us to conclude that Socrates is mortal. So this is what proofs look like in this sort of system that Frege had come up with. Um, so there's a number of things that sort of come out of this. Um, I have a picture of Mr. Spock up at the top here, because when I first started studying logic as an undergraduate, um, almost the first thing um, the lecturer said is, if you study logic, that does not mean you are like Mr. Spock. This does not mean it's the secret to the universe and perfect reasoning that is going to be unraveled. Logic in this kind of system is a lot of it's just about manipulating symbols and rules. And there's a very much a kind of junk in, junk out aspect to this. If these statements that I'm assuming, like all Greeks and men are incorrect, then logic is merely going to allow me to deduce, deduce something incorrect from them. And I rather like this quote that comes from Doctor Who, logic, my dear Zoe, merely enables one to be wrong with authority. So it's quite important to get in your mind, um, especially as we move into the age of computers, that what's happening in lots of these logic systems is manipulation of symbols according to rules. However, in the early 20th century, um, Bertrand Russell and Alfred Whitehead in particular were very taken by this whole sense of suddenly you had some way to capture correct reasoning in a procedural fashion that you could just sort of churn the handle and you could deduce everything. So they came up with this project that they wanted to um, derive all of mathematics from a few very simple axioms using a, a, a logical system, um, and this would sort of capture the whole of mathematics. So they had, there was this big, what was called the logicist program to capture all of mathematics. Um, and sadly, in the 1930s, Kurt Gödel, who we have on the right here, came along and actually managed to prove that um, that was impossible. He, he managed to show that once your system was um, detailed enough, that you could do essentially arithmetic, so multiplication and addition and that sort of things, then there were actually things that were true in that system, which you could not actually prove using logic. I'm not going into the details about how that proof works. It's very cute, um, but it's kind of a bit of a, a side track. So if we move forward to um, the Dartmouth conference, and this um, interest that we suddenly have in can we get human computers to reason like humans? Well, there was this whole body of work in the first half of the 20th century, which was all about trying to capture human reasoning using these rules of logic. So it seemed like a very obvious thing to try and do was to embody that within a computer. So in 1965, 
the kind of, I think, biggest single advance in this area came forward. And this is called the resolution rule. Um, and what um, Robinson did with resolution was he came up with a single rule of inference which kind of covered all the other various rules of inference. inference. So you just had one rule. And if you imagine you have a computer, you don't want to say you could do this or you could do this or you could do this and it has to kind of search and pick each one. You just say no, you use this rule and you keep applying it to the information you've got and it will churn out more facts about the world essentially. Um, and this is the resolution rule. Now the resolution rule, it's what in its kind of full complexity is quite complex. So I've tried to put a really simple version here to give you a feel for what the resolution rule looks like. So above the line, we have either C1 is true or P is true. And imagine C1 is, is something more complicated. It's maybe you know, A or B or C or D or E, some expression like that. But there's some, some stuff or P is true. And we also have some other set of stuff, C2, which is true or P is false, not P. So if you have two statements of this sort of form, then you can match the P and the not P and get rid of them and just take the stuff that's on the other side. So you can deduce from that that either C1 is true or C2 is true. And what you did with resolution is it's called proof by refutation. So you would start with something that you wanted to prove was true and you would assume it is false. And then you would go through the resolution process and your eye intention was to come up with nothing at the bottom. So if you imagine that C1 and C2 are actually both empty, you've just got, I know P and I know not P, then from that you deduce nothing, false. You've got a contradiction. So that's this false symbol again down here. So that was the aim of a resolution proof. You stated what you wanted to prove, you put a knot in front of it, you kept applying the resolution rule and you hoped to end up with empty at the end. And then you could say, yes, it's true. So I've got some versions of um, Socrates is immortal here. So here's, here's one. So I'm assuming that Socrates is a man. Um, and I'm assuming that either Socrates is mortal or Socrates is not a man. And that goes back to that trick where you could say if A implies B, you could turn it around and say not B or A. So it's just that saying, if. Socrates is a man, it implies Socrates is mortal, but we've just put it in this, this form with the knot, because that's what you do with resolution. You, first thing you do is transform everything, so it's a set of ors and knots. And then we wanted to find out if Socrates was mortal, so we negate that, we put a knot in front of it, and that's what we're trying to prove. And so, well, that matches with this mortal Socrates here. So then, by resolution, we get, there's nothing on the other side of the or, on here that's empty but we have a not man here so we get Socrates is not a man that matches with this fact up here that Socrates is a man and we've derived false and so that means our initial question is Socrates mortal is true one of the variants of the resolution rule is when you start putting um, these um, for all statements in so I've got for all x x is mortal or x is not a man then what you do is you kind of search for things you can match to x. So in this one, where I've got um, Socrates is mortal, well, because x is, has this quantification in front, this for all, I can match Socrates with x. So that becomes mortal x or not man, and, sorry, mortal Socrates or not man Socrates, like we had over here. And then we do the proof the same way. And actually when people were, were writing these things out for implementation for sort of convenience i think maybe because you don't have an upside down a on a computer keyboard might have been part of it they dropped this for all and they came up with this convention that if it has a capital letter then it can be matched to something and if it's lowercase letters then it's something you match things to so this x means i can replace it with socrates or i could replace it with aristotle or i could replace it with plato anything i have in the world i can replace this x with and do that as part of the resolution proof. So um, people, I mean, to this day, people are implementing resolution theorem provers and doing, you know, now quite significant pieces of mathematics with them. Um, 
particularly around um, verification of computer programs. That's turned out to be a particularly good area to apply this kind of technology to. Um, what people got into quite quickly after they started looking at resolution and they were all excitedly going away and trying to write programs to prove mathematical theorems um, is uh, decidability. So a decision procedure, at least in this context, is some kind of process or algorithm which is guaranteed to stop and to say whether a statement is true or not. And an area of mathematics is decidable if there's a decision procedure for it. Now, propositional logic, which is where I just have um, the letters and I don't have this for all symbol or the exist symbol, so it's kind of just statements, this is true or this is false, is decidable. But the moment I put in these for all x or there exists an x into some of my statements, then I lose the fact that the logic is decidable. And that means that my resolution theorem prover is not guaranteed to stop. So you can set it a problem, press go, and sit there and twiddle your thumbs, and it will car essentially carry on trying to prove this thing until you kill it. Um, and you, you halt the procedure manually, and you don't know then if this thing you asked it was true or false. Um, so this led to a lot of interest in finding fragments of predicate logic that were decidable. Um, so I came into this field in the early 90s, and it's always been sort of a surprise to me that this is the route that symbolic artificial intelligence went down, because I mean, quite clearly, humans reason all the time in non-decidable theories. I mean, that's part of what we're particularly good at in, in reasoning. The fact that we may not get an answer, we're very good at A, finding the route to the answer, and B, we're quite good at just deciding to give up or do something else if we don't seem to be finding an answer. Um, so part of what happened in symbolic AI was the search for what are called heuristics. So that's ways to make resolution or similar processes find the answer, uh, more likely to find the answer or find the answer more quickly while dealing with the fact that they may not be able to do that. But actually mostly the field went, went down was, okay, let's not use first order predicate logic. Let's instead try and find some other sort of logic, which is let's us say a bit more than propositional logic will let us say, but let's us say a bit less than first order predicate logic will let us say, but where we have a decision procedure, so we know that this thing will eventually stop and give us an answer. At this point, once you've got these theorem provers, um, Symbolic AI went off into a kind of whole load of different directions. Um, one, I think you might have come across, are um, ontologies. So this is, you know, you're still essentially using your Symbolic AI program to reason for you. So to answer questions like, is this true? Um, but what you're trying to do is capture a big body of knowledge um, in all the facts you have available in order to answer questions about um, body of that body of knowledge. So there are a whole load of things called description logics. Um, and these are usually decidable fragments of predicate logic that are designed to describe objects, their attributes, and their relations. Um, you may have come across the um, OWL language. Um, that was the language, the description logic of proposed for the semantic web. Um, you can write OWL in XML. There are a whole load of tools out there to help you reason over OWL um, using OWL ontologies. And, and usually these ontologies are split into two groups of facts. One group of facts are about relationships between things. So for instance, I've written here that if um, X is a student and there is some class C and X is in the class and Y is the teacher of that class, then X is Y's student. And so that would be in these set of facts about relationships between things. And then you also have, as it were, a set of facts about the world, which you're kind of base facts. So for instance, you might know that Susan is a student and Susan is in the history class, and that Barbara is teaching the history class. And then that means your logic can deduce that Susan is Barbara's student. 
And in fact, lots of the applications of description logics um, look a bit like smart databases. You can put these queries in, but instead of having to have sort of absolutely every piece of information in the database, you have some information about relationships between things in the debate database, which allows you to deduce additional facts from that information. Um, I don't know much about the chemical information ontology, but there is an ontology of chemical information. It has some tool support and you can ask that ontology things like, um, please return to me all drugs with a molecular mass, no more than 500, an X log P of less than five, a hydrogen bond except a count of not more than 10 and a hydrogen bond donor count of not more than five. And it will return you a list of, well, certainly, all the drugs within that are stored within the ontology database that um, match that query. So these ontologies let you do, you know, kind of sophisticated, more sophisticated reasonings than you might get out of a simple database. Um, another major direction that um, symbolic AI went into was in planning systems. So the idea here was that in order to take action in the world, you normally have to have some kind of plan of what you need to do. You need to think, first I want to do this, first I want to do this, and then I want to do that, and then I want to do the other, and that will finally get me to the goal of what I'm trying to do. So this picture is of Shaky, which is a very um, early robot system from SRI, and its planner, was called strips. And that's kind of the first really classic example of these symbolic AI planning systems. So in script, strips, you have some initial state of the world, which again, you've expressed in this sort of logical language. So for instance, your initial state of the world might be that you're at square one, and square one is adjacent to square two. And you have a goal state, some state of the world you want to bring about. So in this case, the goal state is that you want to be at square two. And then in the system, you have a whole load of actions. So you'll notice I've got these capital letters here. If you remember, I said these were a way of, of things which can match to things. So X could match to square one, or it could match to square two. So if I want to move from X to Y, then I have some preconditions. Before I can do that move, I have to be at X and X has to be adjacent to Y. So the idea is you have this information about the world, you look at the preconditions and you can see if you can match the preconditions to information that you have about the world. If you can match those preconditions, then you know you can do this action. And then your post conditions tell you what will have changed about the world after you've done the action. So in this case, you will no longer be at X, but you will be at Y. And what planning systems did was let you search through all your actions to create chains, sequences of changes to the world until you got to one in which you've reached your goal state. In this case, it's very simple because I want to be at square two, which is next to square one. So the moment I start plugging these things in, so, okay, I'm at X, I'm at square one, is what's x adjacent to, it's adjacent to y, so that means y will be square two. If I move x, y, then I'll no longer be at square one, and I will be at y, y is square two. Oh look, that was the goal that I was heading for, I'll do that then and I'm done. But obviously planning systems have quite sophisticated ways to chain all these things together and come out with a sequence of actions you want to take. Obviously, um, Strips was first developed in 1971. There's a whole, you know, 50 years of work in this field. How to plan, how to replan if you're halfway through a plan as things start going wrong. How to account for things that might change externally while you're performing an action. What about actions that take a length of time to complete? Loads of stuff you can go look up if you're interested in knowing more about planning. Um, one of the places where um, symbolic AI and machine learning have started to kind of come together is in planning. So um, we now have this formalism called a Markov chain, um, and that's a model that describes a sequence of events and which the probability of each event depends only on the state of the world after the previous event. 
So I have some example here. Suppose I'm holding nothing. So again, I've expressed this in a symbolic way. If I do a pickup action, then there's a 90% chance I'll end up in a state of the world where I'm holding a brick. And there's a 10% chance that I'll end up back where I started in the state of the world where I'm holding nothing. So you can express um, the actions in your planning system in terms of a Markov chain. And then you can do various things. One is you can try and learn these percentages. So you can you know, do lots of things in the world and see how often you end up in what state. And then you can use things like reinforcement learning. So you can have rewards associated with these states and you can try and work out what action you should take in each state to maximize your expected reward. So you begin to get a coming together around this kind of Markov um, chains between symbolic AI and um, machine learning. It must be said, people also apply um, deep neural networks to this. So instead of having, you know, I'm in a state where I'm holding nothing, you just have the raw inputs you might put into a neural net, and then it, it produces a kind of expect, a, a recommended action out. So it's not just symbolic AI that can use this kind of framework. Um, and the last thing I sort of wanted to talk about as to where um, symbolic AI went was programming languages. So um, the urban legend is that, so people were using things like these resolution theorem provers to try and prove mathematical theorems. And they started to notice that some people were able to prove things much more often than other people. And they were able to sort of extract what it was those people doing, how they wrote down their problem. And then they realized that this could become a sort of programming language. So what I have here, again, is, is the sort of logic that you might put into um, a resolution theorem prover. But here I've gone back to this format where I say, I have a, a whole load of things that imply something else. So this is, if I have eggs and I have flour and I have sugar, then I can bake a cake. If I buy X, then I have X. Remember, if I'm using capital letters, that means I can substitute things in for the X. And if the shop has X, then I can buy X. Here, I've just rewritten this one in this format that is used in resolution. So it's I can bake the cake, or I don't have eggs, or I don't have flour, or I don't have sugar. So say I start out with these three facts. I have eggs, I have flour, and the shop has sugar, and I want to bake a cake. So I do my resolution thing is first I assume I can't bake a cake, and then I try and prove that that's incorrect. So not bake cake will match with this bake cake here. So that lets me deduce that either I don't have eggs, or I don't have flour, or I don't have sugar. Well, I have eggs, so those two match, and I have flour, so those two match. I'm sort of skipping a step here where those just vanish. So it's just the problem that um, I don't have sugar. So I don't have sugar, but I had this thing that it, um, if I buy X, then that means I have X. So that's have X or not buy X. So I can match not have sugar, with have x. So that means my problem now is maybe I can't buy sugar, but I can buy, match not buy sugar with buy x here. So I get, well, then this only doesn't work if the shop doesn't have sugar, but the shop does have sugar, so I'm done. So one thing you can do is you can kind of read this back as this kind of chain of actions, you know, I want to buy sugar and then I want to bake the cake. But also this particular format um, where you have a, a set of things, an arrow and then one thing um, after the arrow is a very kind of efficient, easy way to do um, this sort of resolution theorem proving. It lets you kind of chain back quite easily. A little bit of search can be involved. You have to pick sometimes which of these things before the arrow you want to search through. 
So prologue is one of the very early languages that was based on um, this idea. So this is a prologue program. I have some facts. I have eggs, I have flour, the shop has sugar. And I have um, these rules. If I want to bake a cake, then I have to have eggs, flour and sugar. And again, this is a kind of urban legend. Um, the person who invented prologue was absolutely convinced that a colon followed by a dash was the most easy way to represent an arrow on a typewriter keyboard. I don't know why, no one seems to know why, but <clears throat> this is an arrow. And these are the other rules that we, we had in that previous thing. This is the sort of output you get if you run a prologue program. So you usually run it at a command line, like you might do with um, Python or Perl, if you've done some programming with that. So if I put this, loaded this program into Prologue and I type, can I bake a cake? It will say yes. But more usefully, I can say, can I bake X? What might X be if I want to bake it? And then it will say X equals cake. So when I've done bake X there, it's matched it against this bake cake and then checked that it can do all these, um, these well, satisfy all these have statements. And so that gives you the answer x equals cake. And so that's often how you use prologue. You ask it a question where you put some capital letters in um, and then it will give you back an answer which will, if these, if these variables have these values, then this statement is true. Um, if I typed in baked potatoes, then it would say no, because it has, has nothing about how to bake potatoes. Um, in its program. And again, Prolog has been around for 50 years. <laughs> there is a whole load of languages that have their roots in, these are called logic programming languages, which are now a lot more sophisticated. So for instance, my particular area of research, I do a lot of work in um, what are called agent programming languages, and they've extended prologue with a concept of information changing, so perceptions come in from the outside world, and the concept of events, so the language reacts to events, but it looks otherwise quite similar to prologue. You do lots of reasoning over um, the beliefs that your agent has, the goals it has, using this kind of logical style presentation of your reasoning, and then you will take some actions. So again, these languages have extended prologue with a concept of you take some sorts of actions. So those are kind of the major areas of um, symbolic artificial intelligence as a field. Um, I don't want to get into whether symbolic AI is really AI. I feel that's about how you use language. Um, but it is trying to capture um, an, an idea of the way people reason. And I think it's important to go back to that Mr. Spock thing and our um, that it doesn't give you the secret of the universe. And also to understand that advances in psychology and neuroscience tell us now that actually people's reasoning is, is very different from this in lots of ways. If you ask people to justify something they've done, they'll often start giving you an argument that looks like the sorts of things that come out of symbolic AI programs. But a lot of that may be post hoc rationalization that may not be the actual reason they chose in the moment to do a particular thing. However, the advantages of symbolic AI are you do have quite well-defined meanings for what you're, everything you're doing in your program, um, and it conforms to mathematical notions of correct reasoning. So, I mean, there's a whole theory of philosophy about essentially why mathematics works, why mathematics is so hugely successful in helping us understand the world and navigate around the world. But the point is that, that if you do reasoning in this kind of way, then it is a very powerful tool that we have in our, our toolbox for understanding the world and making sense of the world. Um, I've put it's comparatively easy to inspect, understand and analyze. And the reason I put comparatively there is I have seen some really scary prologue programs. And, you know, it's as easy to write a prologue program 
that is really difficult to understand as it is to write a, a C program or a Python program that's difficult to understand. Um, symbolic AI can help you make things look quite clear and logical, but it can't make difficulty and complexity actually go away and you still have to put the work into making things clear. And again, when you get, um, see the operation of, uh, say, a logic programming program or one of these symbolic um, planning systems, then it's quite easy to trace back each step and at least understand in these terms why each step happened. Oh yes, it did that because it thought the outcome of that action would be this and it thought these preconditions held. So that is easier than some of these systems like um, deep neural networks where it's much harder to know why it gave this particular output when you plugged in this particular input. So if things like analysis and understanding are important to you, then symbolic AI can be a useful tool to look at. Um, and I've also put, it has this quite compact representation of information and solutions. So one of the issues you have with the kind of current explosion of interest in deep learning and similar kinds of technologies is that you have to have a lot of data. You have to give uh, an awful lot of examples um, before the system learns to do the thing you want. Um, in comparison to symbolic AI, if you can express what you're supposed to do in a logical term, you know, if you do this, then this will happen, then you just have to put that one piece of information into the system and it's there. You don't have to have hundreds or thousands of examples to train the system on. Um, so I put some cons here. So one is I put high knowledge engineering overhead. So I've just said you've got this wonderful compact representation as opposed to you have to have all this data. But obviously if you have some kind of complex domain like for instance, chemical information, then someone has to write down all that information in this kind of logical format and put it into the system. So you have to have an expert with time available to do that. You can't just find lots of examples or just go and send this thing out into the world um, to observe things. Someone has to have to sit down and craft the information that the system is going to use. Um, they can be quite inflexible. I mean, I've not talked much about reasoning about risk and uncertainty and probability. You can do that, but you know, predicate logic was um, undecidable. Predicate logic with probabilities, you know, gets even scarier um, to reasoning. So, so that can be difficult. And again, if you've got this kind of carefully crafted, knowledge engineered set of information, if some of it's wrong or some of it you change your mind, then you often have to do a whole load of work to, to change it as information changes. Um, it does not apply well for continuous processes. So um, representing a differential um, equation in logic is not pretty. Um, so if you want you know, your, your feedback control for a robot, which typically you model using differential equations, then symbolic AI is quite a clumsy tool for trying to do that well with. Um, and perhaps, I think most critically, um, it does not apply well if the problem can't easily be expressed in terms of statements and rules. And, and vision is the most obvious example of this. We have, we have absolutely no real comprehension of how you can go from a set of pixels um, to its attack. Um, we, we, even trying to think of how you would, would write that down in, in terms of formal logic, I have no idea. I mean, maybe someone else out there is, is working on this. But so, so, you know, vision is a big problem and there's a whole load of situations. So we don't really know how people do things, but we don't really know um, what the best sets of rules are, then we can't start using symbolic AI because the first thing you have to be able to do is write down the rules and the statements. So there's lots of places where it doesn't really kind of apply to the sorts of problems we want to solve. <coughs> um, 
obviously, there is now quite a bit of interest in ways you might be able to combine the advantages of uh, learning systems and neural statistical representations of information, which neural networks are probably the most famous, with symbolic AI to try and get the, the advantages you have in terms of compact representations, ease of analysis, correctness of reasoning, with the flexibility and the ability to talk about continuous processes and to capture things that we don't know explicitly how we solve. So I've just put down um, a few examples here. So one thing you can use is you can try and use your machine learning process to actually learn these symbolic rules. So instead of having um, a knowledge engineer go away and craft a description of the domain knowledge, instead um, you feed lots of examples in, but what you get it to spit out are um, the actual rules you want in logic. And so then once you've learned the rules, you can plug that into some kind of traditional symbolic AI system, and that's where you actually do your decision making. So then you've got the sort of transparency and the analyzability you want there, but you've not had to go through the knowledge engineering process. Um, I put an example here of a system that does something a bit like that. So um, Gen F is a system for um, ethical reasoning. Um, and what um, the Andersons did in creating Gen F is that they had a panel of medical ethicists um, and they gave them various examples of medical ethics problems and the panelists would explain what they thought the, um, the resolution of the dilemma should be and why. And this was then plugged into a uh, machine learning system which then learnt um, sort of contextual priorities amongst values. So, you know, how do I, I weigh patient autonomy against patient privacy? Well, in this particular situation, this is more important than this. And it, what came out was a kind of, well, actually it looks more like a system of equations, but you can see it as a system of, of rules. Um, and then the system actually reasons with that. So if you want to know why, it says, well, I learned from the medical ethicists that in this situation, this consideration is more important than this consideration. So you get the analyzability, but you haven't had to craft the rules yourselves. Um, another thing you can do is you can use machine learning to sort of generate the input that goes into then a symbolic AI system. So in particular, um, if you've got some kind of robotic system, which is the area I'm working in, you might want to use a machine vision system to spit out, you know, the cat is on the mat. You plug that in to some reasoning system, which then decides using traditional symbolic rules. Yeah, I don't know whether you want to move the cat or you want to move around the cat or whatever the particular problem is. Um, and here's an example of a system that's doing that, um, uh, autonomous nuclear waste management. So in that system, um, it's a rover arm that's trying to sort um, nuclear waste for reprocessing, and it has to decide some, some things have to be stuck in barrels full of concrete, some can be burnt, some can be melted, there's a variety of things you can do. So there's a um, machine vision system that identifies what the object is, and then a symbolic AI system decides what should be done with that object. And of course, obviously in the nuclear industry, um, things like assurance are really important. So being able to analyze the decisions and guarantee that it will always put things it thinks are made of wood in this particular box, and it will always put things it thinks are made of metal in this other particular box is quite valuable to that domain. Um, this is um, quite a recent thing, the papers from 2020. Um, so if you, if you're working with a machine vision system, a deep, you know, deep learning machine vision system, you have these things called convolutional layers, which represent um, sort of useful manipulations on images. Um, and they're one of the things that has really ramped up the power of what you can do with machine vision systems. So the idea is to have similar sort of neural network layers that maybe capture sort of symbolic relationships between things. So this is quite preliminary work. What um, Shanahan was trying to do was he had um, pictures of sort of abstract shapes. There'd be several abstract shapes and he wanted the 
the system to be able to identify if the shapes were in a row, so either stacked one on top of the other or, or horizontally. Um, and he trained this system on one set of pictures with one kind of abstract shapes. Then he took them away, but he had this special layer, which was hopefully had learned this kind of concept of, you know, stacked on top of each other or stacked horizontally. He kept that pre-trained bit in, put in a whole new set of abstract shapes and was able to show that um, it learnt better what these, um, when these new sorts of shapes were appropriately stacked. Um, so that's quite preliminary work, but, but the idea that you could have somehow these, this compact representation which you could transmit, transfer between learning systems so you get some of this compact reusability of knowledge um, across domains. Um, it must be said, this bit down here, um, I only thought of yesterday and I couldn't find a, a paper that does it. I'm sure someone must have done this. You could use symbolic reasoning as um, part of the reward function. So instead of having to have a person who says, yes, that thing is a good thing or that thing is a bad thing or something explicitly annotated, um, you might, for instance, have a neural net that generates a candidate molecule for some person. Uh, purpose and then you've got the chemical ontology and it can check that this molecule at least has certain properties so it's a kind of rational suggestion and if it isn't then instead of someone else having to look at that and annotate that that could be used as part of the training process for the neural net i'm sure someone's doing this it was just i hadn't thought of it till yesterday so i didn't have a chance to kind of dig out the paper so that is a kind of whirlwind tour of symbolic artificial intelligence i hope it's given you some sort of idea of what the field consists of uh, and what its strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, thank you very much.